Hey guys, this is Ashish Goyal from Pediatrics Board Review. I'm going to be covering the endocrinology chapter, so how about we go ahead and get started? So once again, my name is Ashish Goyal. I am the author of Pediatrics Board Review. I'm also the creator of the Pediatrics Board Review Success Blueprint, which can help you pass your pediatric boards the very first time. There is a money back first time guarantee, obviously associated with the Pediatrics Board Review. And if you don't have the Success Blueprint because you don't have a hard copy version of the PBR or an online version, you can get it by going to pediatricsboardreview.com forward slash blueprint, and you will get essentially the entire introduction of the PBR along with the table of contents. Uh, I am located in Hawaii and uh, I am a board certified pediatrician as well as a board certified internal medicine physician. All right, let's talk about rickets. So you want to think about rickets kind of as a syndrome which has potentially multiple different etiologies to it. So, um, you know, with rickets, you can end up getting fractures, deformities like bow legging, uh, bone pain. You can get various different things. Um, in terms of more of a definition of it, we can say that rickets is a disorder with multiple possible causes, which leads to defective mineralization of bones before the epiphyseal closure. Uh, and it can be due to a deficiency of or an impaired metabolism of a few different things. So there's vitamin D problems, phosphorus problems, or and or calcium problems. Okay, so it can be any of those three things that ends up, and, and they all kind of tie in together, obviously, but it can be uh, one of diff many different um, actual physiologic reasons that someone ends up g getting rickets, which is essentially a, a syndrome. All right, so let's get into it a little bit more. So findings of rickets may include widening of the wrists, uh, ankles, um, at the growth plate area, bowing of the legs, pain, a decreased growth rate, anorexia, enlarged costochondral junctions, which is also called rachitic rosary. Um, anytime they have these silly little names and things like that, I always try to remember those particular findings, um, especially just because if it has a name like that, it's common. It's supposedly commonly known, and it's a very testable type of thing. Uh, not that you need to know about rachitic rosary, but you actually need to know about the enlarged costochondral junctions. Um, pigeon chest, delayed suture or fontanelle closure, frontal bossing, which is basically thickening of the skull, or bad tooth enamel. And bad tooth enamel. There's no singular lab pattern for rickets. It can be due to vitamin D deficiency, secondary to one of multiple different disorders. So you must learn the lab patterns associated with the calcium and phosphorus abnormalities. Okay, so the first pattern I want to talk about is um, where you have a normal calcium and a low phosphorus. Now in parentheses I'm putting over here low, but I think in general if you are presented with somebody uh, who has familial hypophosphatemic rickets, which is also known as vitamin D resistant rickets, it's, um, it, it's probably a case that's going to show up with a normal calcium and a low phosphorus. Potentially, you know, there can be low calcium and low phosphorus, but I think they would reserve that for something else. So in general, for familial hypophosphatemic rickets, also sometimes called vitamin D resistant rickets, look for a normal calcium and a low phosphorus. So this is an X-linked dominant renal disorder, and there's a defect of phosphate reabsorption in the proximal tubule and a defect of the kidney to convert 25 vitamin D into the active form of 125 vitamin D. So the way that you treat it, you actually give them oral phosphate supplementation and you avoid the hypocalcemia by giving them the active form of vitamin D. So the 125 form. Okay. So once again, there is a problem with calcium. There is also a, there's potentially also a, a problem with calcium, but in general, the biggest problem tends to be with phosphorus. So that's why you give them oral phosphate supplementation. But in order to avoid that hypocalcemia, because there is somewhat of a problem with vitamin D as well, uh, you go ahead and give them the active active form of vitamin D. Okay, uh, Labs, once again, will show either a normal or a low calcium, uh, but it will definitely show a low serum phosphate. Uh, these patients also have high alkaline phosphatase, so that's one of the differentiating factors for this particular uh, disease. Um, and the vitamin D25, so the 25 vitamin D, um, is going to be normal and the PTH is also going to be normal because the calcium is usually normal. All right. 
All right, so here's a pearl. Um, you know, for the exam, once again, uh, they'll probably keep it simple and avoid giving you a low calcium level. Um, so what you really want to look for is some of those other differentiating factors like a high alkaline phosphatase, uh, a normal vitamin D25 level. And uh, just remember that the 125 level would then actually be low because the kidneys uh, are struggling to actually conjugate it over to 125. And in terms of thinking about, you know, why is it called vitamin D resistant? rickets. So this isn't necessarily in the PBR book yet, but um, the reason that it's called vitamin D resistant rickets, the way that I think about it is, let's say you have a patient who presents and they have, you know, rickettic rosary and you decide, well, I'm going to treat them with vitamin D. What's going to happen? They're going to get the active form of uh, vitamin D, so 125, and that's going to help them go ahead and normalize their calcium potentially. But what's going to happen with their phosphorus? It's not going to help that because you still need the phosphorus supplementation. And without having both of those normal, you're still going to end up having issues. So that's why you can think about this as vitamin D resistant rickets. So another place where you actually might find a very similar pattern, so normal calcium and a low phosphorus, uh, could be in the very initial depletion of vitamin D. So the low vitamin D results in low phosphorus, phosphorus reabsorption. There's a compensatory increase in your PTH, and because of that, you temporarily get a normalization in that calcium. Okay, so the increase in PTH causes a temporary normali normalization in calcium, uh, but this particular lab pattern, normal calcium plus low phosphorus, could be in two different places. It could be the uh, familial hypophosphatemic uh, rickets, or it could also be in the very earliest stages of vitamin D. All right, so here's a pearl. So for the test, they'll probably want you to focus more on familial hypophosphatemic rickets. The differentiating, the differentiating lab here would be the low vitamin D level in early vitamin D uh, depletion versus a normal vitamin D level, the 25 vitamin D, in familial hypophosphatemic rickets. All right, here are some more uh, different patterns that you might end up getting in terms of calcium and phosphorus. You can end up getting low calcium and low phosphorus. And this basically represents severe vitamin D deficiency. As you know, uh, vitamin D helps with both calcium and phos phosphorus uh, reabsorption. And if your vitamin D level is super low, then, or if this has been going on for a while, the phosphorus went down first, PTH was uh, increased in order to try to compensate. And so for a little while, your calcium was doing okay, but then eventually it couldn't keep up anymore. And so now your calcium level is low as well. Okay. Um, and in that situation, your PTH is going to continue to be high. It's just, it won't be able to strip any more calcium away from your bones. Um, or if it, it's just going in a very slow way, but uh, your calcium level overall should be low. Your phosphorus should be low and your PTH level should be very high. Uh, another pattern would be low calcium and a normal phosphorus. So this is low calcium, normal phosphorus, as opposed to the first two patterns that we talked about where your calcium was normal, but your phosphorus was low. All right. So this would actually represent vitamin D repletion. So when you start to give back the vitamin D, your phosphorus normalizes first, and then eventually your calcium is also going to normalize. And that would be in the healing phase of vitamin D uh, deficient deficiency rickets. Another uh, pattern that you could potentially see is low calcium and high phosphorus. And this would potentially be seen in hypoparathyroidism. And uh, as you know, with hyperparathyroidism, you get high calcium, potentially low phosphorus. In hypoparathyroidism, you're not going to have enough calcium, so low calcium and high phosphorus. Um, this can also happen in phosphorus overload. Uh, it can also happen in pseudo hypoparathyroidism, and they all result in perceived or real low PTH in the body. Okay, so that's one good way to think about it is if you're in phosphorus overload, uh, your PTH may end up being low. If you are hypoparathyroid, your PTH will definitely be low. And um, if you have pseudo hypoparathyroidism, as far as your body is concerned, uh, the PTH really isn't doing anything. And uh, just as a recap in terms of your uh, PTH and uh, your parathyroid hormone, um, you know, the mechanism behind it is that uh, PTH will actually increase your calcium uh, reabsorption in the kidneys, and it will actually increase the release 
of phosphate within the kidneys. It also helps to uh, take calcium from your bones and bring it into the bloodstream. So really what it's trying to do is increase the calcium level within your uh, bloodstream. And when there's not enough of it, that doesn't happen. And instead of your kidneys encouraging the release uh, or the PTH encouraging the uh, release, of phosphate through the urine uh, that's not happening in which uh, and because of that you end up getting an elevated phosphorus level okay and anytime your phosphorus level is high your calcium level usually goes in the opposite direction and vice versa all right another pattern would be normal calcium and high phosphorus and this represents renal disease uh, growth hormone excess or a high phosphorus diet all right, moving on to rickets of prematurity. So this can also be called osteopenia of prematurity, and it's very possible that they could actually uh, present it as osteopenia of prematurity instead of rickets of prematurity on the exam. So please be familiar with both terms. Uh, premature babies have a very high requirement of vitamin D, calcium and phosphorus they need all three and this specifically tends to refer to very low birth weight babies um, and failure to administer these three different components can result in rickets of prematurity so treat with vitamin d calcium and phosphorus just treating with vitamin d alone is insufficient uh, now moving on from rickets uh, 